okay. have an hour to go. And here we have a tonight's a session of Meet the Press with these heavy hitters from the bond markets. Uh, we've got Andrew Brenner and uh, Leon Tatavosian speaking. Um, usually I read the resumes, but in this case, um, they're so long and, and so detailed because they have so many accomplishments. I'm going to ask them each to summarize the, the key uh, points that they want to emphasize for this particular talk. Um, one more question I forgot to ask before the talk was, um, do you guys want to take questions during the talk or hold them till after? We're happy during the talk, Andy. What do you say? I think we need to take them during the talk because as you go to the end, you know, it, you know people, people have a question, let's, a, let's answer it right away. So I'm ready whenever they are. Okay, I agree. That's, uh, that's in context. I think the questions will be better. And uh, we'll just try to keep, make sure we keep you guys on track. Um, so please uh, both introduce yourself briefly, if you don't mind, and then let's uh, launch into the talk. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Always wonderful to see you. Andy, you want, you want to go first? Yeah, sure. My name is Andy Brenner. Uh, I'm Wharton undergrad, Wharton grad. I've been working on Wall Street for a good number of years. I'm not going to say how many. Uh, previously, I was at Guggenheim, I spent time at Nomura, and now I'm at a small regional in Austin, Texas called Natalliance Securities. Uh, I'm, I've kind of gravitated more into a macro strategist. You'll see me on uh, Fox Business with Liz Clayman. You'll see me on Bloomberg. You'll see me on uh, TD, YouTube, so on and so forth, talking about which way I think the markets are going to go and why. So that's kind of my claim to fame. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining uh, the talk. I'm Leon Tadavosi, and I'm an adjunct at uh, Tangent and Courant in quantitative finance. I worked on the street for many years, uh, sell side positions, uh, strategy, trading, and most recently at Royal Bank of Canada in a market risk covering securitized products. So everybody, hello. Um, our theme today is kind of like twofold. One, we want to kind of explain a little bit about how seasoned people like Andy look at the rate markets, which signals they interpret, how the relative importance of the signals may have changed due to the extraordinary things that have happened in the bond market, actually the last 10 years, but more recently the last couple of years. And we want to, we want to talk a little bit about how those um, uh, themes uh, are interpreted in the relative valuation of what we could call risk or spread product. So there's a class of investment uh, options that are priced relative to the rates markets like corporate bonds and so on. We wanna talk about a little bit about is how is what's going on right now are the usual tools that people use to say to themselves, the rates doing this, how should I feel about valuations in those other markets, whether it's stocks, implied volatility, whatever, commodities, whatever. Are the old rules applicable in trying to translate rates action into valuation decisions in those other markets? Or is the world totally different because of what has happened last couple of years with the extraordinary intervention, the massive Fed balance sheet, the sell down that's about to begin, the aggressive uh, tightening uh, regime, which, which we already are in the midst of, and so on. That's, so it's going to be a two-pronged type of um, approach to our talks. So let me begin. Can everybody see the slides? Yeah, we can see them. OK, thank you very see. much. OK. OK, so let me go and start. OK, so um, Andy, please feel free to chime in, of course, on the first couple of pages. So clearly, the biggest um, economic development in the last year, year and a half was a dramatic increase in inflation. What was the word of uh, the preferred word, at least to try to make it sound more benign, the word was transitory. Supply chain disruptions were causing uh, these increase, dramatic increase in inflation, base effects and the like. Uh, there was kind of a optimistic view that these um, dislocations would slowly uh, um, dissipate. Get, get, dissipate over a period of time. Whether that's happened remains to be seen. Andy, I'm sure will comment on that. Um, one of the big things that happened earlier this year was the trajectory of the Fed tightening, which people were anticipating was pulled dramatically forward. And we'll talk about that as well. I mean, the first tightening, of course, happened um, middle of last month. So continuing with the theme I just talked about, what we want to know is like um, whenever you see action in rates, directional moves, increases in volatility, reshapes of the curve or whatever, what do people look at? to take from that action to see what it means for other markets. Like, does it mean, you know, 
be very defensive in equities? Does it mean, let's say, you should try to avoid this sector or the corporate market or whatever? So we want to speak a little bit about that. And again, we want to, in the same theme, we want to sort of say, well, valuations we'll talk about have given up somewhat? Have they given up enough, right? Do we think that, uh, you know, compared to other regimes where we've been in this tightening cycle, is there more to go in cheapening of the valuations of these other products? Or is, is it kind of like as the behavior that we've seen up to now, pretty much what we would have expected based on historical, um, you know, relationships? Okay, so what are the basic themes? Okay, so we're gonna talk about that. How do people look at the rates markets? How do they interpret how it's moving, how it may move, right? Are, have these drivers changed in their relative importance? Like let's say is, um, I don't know, is our employment reports less important right now than they used to be, for instance? Is uh, inflation information more important? Is uh, labor market um, conditions uh, more determinative? That's what we wanna talk about as well. So in, in line with that, we wanna speak about which of these things are re relevant to the pricing of risk assets. If we sort of see some kind of weak news in the uh, corporate sector or the consumer sector, that may have an effect on rates or maybe the rate movement could have an effect on the corporate sector or the commercial consumer sector. And that in turn may have an effect on valuation of consumer assets like credit card ABSs and things like that, right? And uh, again, same kind of idea, the, um, the all the, these, these things interact. The capital markets you know, are affected by rates markets, which in turn the commercial consumer uh, markets, uh, uh, real economy are affected as well. Uh, finally, I'm going to put Andy on the spot a bit, right? Are we on the way to more reasonable valuations across the entire fixed income universe? Would that be good? Would that be bad? I mean, do we, expe do we, do we expect even with a, will a strong economy bail us out and not push valuations necessarily that much softer? So that's going to be among the themes we're going to cover. So here's the last employment report. Hey, Leo, do you want me, do you want me to start? Yes, you know, go ahead now, Andy. Any, yeah. any of the two well, pages actually, of let's, questions let's, you just asked? Or? Well, do you want to, okay, if you want to do that, and then I'll go to the employment report. Go ahead, Andy, I'm sorry. Listen, basically, basically I think we're in a unique environment. Uh, you know, I hate to use the term, uh, you know, we're in some, it's different this time around because it, it always scares me. But the reality is that we've never been in a situation where the Fed has manipulated the rate structure down so low for so long. And now they're in 100% reversal, and they're going to be raising rates more than likely 50 basis points per meeting, which is May, the next three meetings, May, June, and July, respectively. So whereas we have 50 basis point Fed funds right now, we could be looking at 2% by the end of July. So that's one big change. Secondly, you've never had, historically, the Fed kept the balance sheet at $800 billion. They moved it up under Bernanke when, when they started doing quantitative easing, they moved it up between four and five trillion. So now it's up to just under nine trillion. And they're now gonna to start to unwind that. They're gonna unwind it at a very rapid rate that is going to be maybe not in the month of May, but starting around June or July, it's gonna be 95 billion a month or 1 trillion a year. So that 1 trillion a year is gonna add another 100 maybe 125 basis points to the rate structure. And it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, you know, ru wreak havoc with the, uh, with the yield curve. So, you know, are valuations going to get better? Yeah, but you've been pretty well hurt this year if you've been in investment grade bonds. I mean, investment grade using the LQD is down in the vicinity of, I don't know, 12 or 13% year to date. And we're only in, in the middle of April. You know, if you've owned government bonds, the government, you know, the, the index itself of treasuries is down 9.8% year to date. That's pretty awful, you know, for treasuries. And then, you know, if you look at, if you look at the, uh, the government ETF, GOVT, you know, you're down somewhere in the vicinity of 8, eight to 9% year to date. So being in treasuries has not been a, a very good thing to do. You know, as far as where rates- I have a question, late, actually. Um, you said to interrupt. Please. Just Kevin, go ahead. Sure. 50 basis points uh, the next three meetings. Is that your opinion or does that tend to be the consensus? Like what, what do the futures say about future? Uh, we're going we're to show, we're gonna show a picture of that. No, no, Kevin. no. Let, let me answer it. Go ahead, if, you look go ahead, at, if you look at what I like to watch, which is WIRP on Bloomberg, 
which is world interest rate probabilities. It now has it now has 50 as a foregone conclusion, and Powell pretty much said that today in his uh, speech. So 50 in May, and then they have between June and July they have another four rate increases, or basically between now and the end of at the July meeting, it's now I think 5.8. So six would be three fifties in a row. So now Leon, go to the next one. Yeah, I'm just looking, there's the euro dollar complex guys, Kevin, there's the complex. So these 22 is, is below 90, 97 the buck. So that's quite a number of tightenings. <laughs> But that's a good, so we'll, we'll, we'll that, revisit that point very shortly, actually. I'm sorry, Andy, yeah, go ahead. I mean, uh, what I would say is, is I really think that the Fed is going to front load, and which is what James Bullard's been saying now for multiple months, and Powell pretty much reiterated that again today. And I think the Fed will start to slow down. Right now, the expectation is close to nine, nine to 10 additional rate hikes this year. And that would put you, you know, close to 3%. I believe the Fed is not going to tighten that much, but they are going to front load, and I think they're going to let the balance sheet do a lot of a lot of the work. Now, as far as risk assets and values, yeah, sure. I mean, the markets have been manipulated with lower rates for a long time, and people have been struggling to find value and paying too much for a lot of stuff, and, and things are starting to get cheaper. Have they cheapened enough? Probably not. You know, high yields needs, in my opinion, needs to get cheaper. But corporate balance sheets are, are the good thing is corporate balance sheets are still in pretty good shape. And okay, am I supposed to admit this guy? I guess I, just, I did. I did it, Andy. Okay, good. So I mean, I, I, you know, Leon, why don't you ask me a couple of questions? Okay, I mean, sure. I'll, okay, I'll go through all these. Yeah. So let's things. go. Let's let's look at some of the usual the usual suspects that people look at to try to gauge where the rates markets are headed, okay? So obviously one of them is employment story. So here's the snapshot of the last uh, employment, unemployment report. unemployment rate from, from April 1st. Right, yeah, came out April 1st, for, it's the March report. So what is that, well, Andy, you want to read off some of the numbers? Well, we saw a strong print in non-farm payrolls, 490, because that was the 431. Oh, I said it wrong. Oh, I, no, I messed it up. I, real, but, I had it backwards, but, but, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, but, th but that's fine because between the revision, whatever, it was a strong employment number. But the reality yeah. is, Powell has said, and you know, you take the lead from the Fed chair because this is a market that is going to, that is following what the Fed is saying and what the Fed is more than likely going to do. So you have to look at what Powell's looking at. And one of the things that he's been looking at are the JOLTS numbers. Now, do the JOLTS numbers tell you how many jobs? how many excess jobs are out there that are unfilled. And that number last I looked was over 11 million. Paul also looks at the quits ratio. In other words, how, how people are quitting jobs and how easy it is for them to get new jobs. Now, that, those are the two things that Paul's looking and he feels that, in fact, he even said this uh, last week, he feels that they need to get the JOLTS ratio, the JOLTS numbers down. And he doesn't believe, and this is wrong, he doesn't believe that the rising, the raising of Fed, uh, of the, the raising of interest rates by the Fed will will affect unemployment. Let me just read to you something that BlackRock put out last week. BlackRock estimated that bringing inflation down to the Fed's target of two percent could push employment to nearly ten percent, based on historical relationships between inflation and employment. So, you know, Powell seems to think that by raising rates to three hundred you know, to 300 basis points is not going to affect employment. Well, I don't think it's going to send the economy into recession. It is definitely going to affect unemployment. Unemployment should start to, to rise sometimes towards the end of this year. And one of the other things that we're looking at, even though we still don't think a recession, is if you look at mortgage rates, and Leon, I know I'm going way in front of, of, of future slides, but okay. you know, ahead, I'm no on problem. a roll. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> you know, I mean, a year ago, a mortgage was 280. Today, that mortgage is probably in the vicinity of 530. A year ago, a $300,000 loan, your monthly payment would be approximately 1250 a month. That payment today is 1630 a month. So in, in trying to put that in, in, in other terms, if you could afford a $300,000 mortgage you know, one year ago, 
The most you can afford using the same parameters is 228,000 today. So housing markets, even though the housing markets lag and they haven't shown weakness yet, they are going to start showing a lot of weakness. So I think that, that again, is gonna slow down the economy. And I think that's something the Fed has to be careful about, which is why I don't think the Fed's gonna raise rates as quickly uh, or as much, excuse me, they're gonna move as quickly, but they're not, gonna, they're not gonna raise as much as many anticipate. Again, nine or 10 hikes this year, in addition to the one we saw in mid-March. Oh. Any other questions uh, on that score? If not, I'd like to go to inflation. Whereas sure, a, lot of people, that, yeah. a lot of people, you know, are, it, some of the inflation is obvious. You know, it, the, the inflation, CPI, 8.5% year over year, PPI, 11.2% year over year. You know, housing rental costs based on the services that we subscribe to or we read is up over 17% year over year. But you know what? It's not just us. Yesterday, if you can believe this, yesterday, Germany came out with their PPI number, producer price index. It was almost 31% year over year. So that's how ridiculous some of these inflation numbers have gotten. Now, do I think the Fed can bring inflation back to 2%? No, not even close. Not, not in a very long time. But I do think inflation is going to subside. But one of the things that I fear is that inflation is pretty much in this time around, it's a supply side phenomenon. And the Fed by raising rates are going, is going after the demand side. So, you know, you're basically, you're not going after where inflation is, nor can the Fed. You know, the Fed can't, can't build factories. The Fed can't, you know, increase number of ships. The Fed can't increase number H of workers. Tru hire truckers to drive. To drive uh, right, to right. The, uh... So, you know what, it, it, it's going to be, I think, I don't know that it's going to be an unmitigated disaster, but I think it's going to be difficult to have what they hope to have, which is a soft landing. I think it's going to be very choppy. And we're starting to see that, you know, as I, started to say to Armand at the beginning of this, for those that weren't on at the very beginning, is you're having all these upheavals in interest rates. You have 15, 20 basis points a day. You know, you had, I mean, at one point this morning, the S&Ps were up 50 points and they closed down 65. You've got a tremendous amount of dislocation. And, and one of the other things that's going on is that there's a real lack of liquidity out there. And with the Fed going to start to unwind the balance sheet, they're going to move the risk of mortgages from a Fed who doesn't price, who doesn't care about convexity risk and doesn't mark to market. They're going to move the risk of convexity from the Fed to the street. And the street is not set up for that. So I think you're going to have even more volatility. I think you're going to have a steeper yield curve than what many anticipate. So I, I've just thrown a lot of different things in a lot of different ways. So why don't I stop a minute? And there was a, a, a question, a question about Andy. You're talking about the liquidity. You know, there was a there was a piece in the journal you heard in the street about how the, the banks they have their you know the the whole hold to sell of um, available available, 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 for, sale. available for sale available yeah, for sale. All, and, all and that if they were to mark that they'd have significant losses. Right, and that's uh, that, that stuff is really getting to be a problem now. You know, because um, you know these they're so I think those anybody you know you by anybody who bought treasuries over the last you know three months you're going to be underwater mostly you know these banks. So at some point, you know, when's that that um, that hit going to be? And so the banks are, are not able to really even. Plus, that they, they've had all these, all these deposits coming in, and they're and they're forced to, on the capital requirements, you know. So they've they've had a lot a lot of issues with managing the capital position. But so the banks are, are not going to be a good place to, to house some of these some of the some of the um, the debt, right? I mean, the banks, this government debt, are, is not going to flow into the banks. But I, I have a feeling, well, though, Andy, I have a feeling, though, that they're talking with the big asset managers. They're trying to gauge the capacity to wear all this risk over the next X number of months or so on. Right. I mean, certainly you're going to dump $100 billion of paper in the market. Right. In the midst of a rising rate environment, you have to basically be prepared. hundred for billion a month. a month. Exactly. That's what I said. hundred billion a month. Um, just like, for instance, I'll give you one little for instance, and we'll, we'll come back to this in, in greater detail later. But if you go back to one of the earlier QEs, 
uh, one of the things they proposed in trying to extract liquidity from the market was to have the Fed repo out their paper in, into the private markets. And there was a tremendous convulsion because the market said, is there enough capacity among the SEC lenders to borrow all this government and mortgage paper, right? Even though the risk was not being transferred, you needed balance sheet capacity to wear this. And there was concern about that capacity not really being available to the extent necessary. And that actually idea was ultimately shelved. They didn't do that. This was around, I think, around the time of the taper trend, the taper tantrum, I believe. But we'll come, we'll come back to the balance sheet in a little bit. But I want to go talk about inflation first, because. Um, um, okay. yes. Just one quick question. Yes. Um, I think Andy had mentioned, or you had mentioned, a hundred billion a month. Is that both Treasuries and MBS, or one yes. Of well, so it's uh, let's break it down. It's sixty billion a month in Treasuries and thirty-five billion a month in mortgages. Now, the thing with mortgages is that because of, of the massive increase in mortgage rates, there aren't going to be a lot of refis. So the, the amount of refis, which last I looked was $38 billion for the month of April, will probably start going below the Fed's uh, willing to buy of up to $35 billion. So the Fed will probably f find it uh, not enough mortgages in, that are being refinanced, and uh, they might have to slow it down. But we think that by the end of the year, the Fed will start selling mortgages outright. They have 2.7 trillion of mortgages. So 60 and 35 respectively are the numbers. But to get to Armand's point- Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I, I could- Go ahead. The, the duration, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Andy. No, go ahead, Andy, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, what happened to Andy? I think we lost Andy. Yeah, he's, go he's gone. Okay, he'll get back on, it's okay. Yeah. Let's wait. Let me, go, let me go back to the slides while we're at. Let me just do the slides for a second while we're at it here. Okay. Let me go to the inflation page. There he is. Andy, are you back? Yeah, sorry about that. Someone no called and, and, and knocked me off. Okay, I, so let's look. That's fine. So, it, whatever. Right. Okay, basically, so, so, what I was going to say about interest. Yeah, go ahead. All right, basically, what I was going to say to put perspective of interest rates at the beginning of this year, two years were 73 basis points. They hit 270 today. Five years were 126. They hit 301 today. 10 years, 151. They hit 298 two nights ago. And 30 years were 190. They hit 303 two nights ago. So, I mean, these aren't, these aren't your normal moves. <laughs> these are very quick moves and very difficult, uh, very difficult to manage. So I, I think that's a lot of it. And, you know, mortgage spreads, you know, Liam likes to, to look at OAS mortgage spreads, and maybe he's right. But what I look at is Bloomberg puts out the 510 blend, and that's moved from the low 60s out to about 116. And then, of course, you add in everything else and your average mortgage rate has gone from, you know, it's gone from the beginning of the year of 330 from bankrate.com to basically 530. So you're up 200 basis points. So That's a lot of hurt. <laughs> and for those that like to say that the Fed, you know, is the financial conditions are still easy, baloney. These, are, these financial conditions are much more strict than they have been. And, you know... You know all also, you got to remember, Andy, when it comes to, I think people don't realize that when it comes to rates, it's much more hurtful for asset managers. Going from you know six to eight is a much less of a price drop than going from you know one to three. Yeah, exactly. A huge oh, difference. Percentage wise, absolutely. No right. Question. So, so the dollar value of an one, let's say, is, is like eight cents for a for a ten year now. It was just at a high yields. It's like maybe like six or. Or five and a half. So you're talking about you know double whammy in terms of how much the P and L of the asset manager are getting hit by by these declines in the yeah. bond prices. There, like a thirty year, you're looking at you're looking at looking at DVO one about twenty, maybe twenty six, <laughs> twenty seven. Yeah, when it used right. to be about when it used to be about maybe 17? 15 or fourteen. You know, right, yeah, back in the eighties or nineties. So it's a double a double hit in your price. And look, even some of these days you lost. Just in one day, your coupon 
in price move, <laughs> right? Yeah, so right. You, you've lost your coupon in one day. Your annual, your annual coupon in one day, yeah, right. It's yeah. gone. Right, right. That's why I'm saying that this, I think, is a very u- unique situation. This is not your standard Fed tightening of 2015, 16, 17. This is not your, I mean, this is, uh, I really wasn't around much for the beginning of the Volcker years. But, you know, there, there was, I think Larry Summers said it well this past week on our Wall Street Week. He said, you might be looking at the inflation numbers of the Volcker regime or the Volcker time frame and look at today's inflation numbers and say that Volcker had it much worse. But he said they've, they've changed the way that, that they calculate inflation from the, from the early 80s or the late 70s when Volcker was around to today. And the reality is inflation is about the same today as it was during the time when we had 14% 30 years. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying we're going to 14% 30 years, okay? That's not what I'm saying. And nor do I think, I mean, historically, you should have your interest rates, your 10 years should be inflation plus GDP. So that would put you at 10% 10-year yields. You know, the U.S. economy will go bankrupt with a 10% 10-year yield. So I don't see us getting much above three and three-eighths, three and a half. And, you know, as Armand said, Bank of America is out there saying that you should be buying now. And the Financial Times had an article this afternoon saying the same thing. Now, I'm not saying that, but I don't know that we have a lot more to go. And I do believe that inflation is going to subside from transitory well, effects. Paul just used the term too the much is, I, in I, I, 2021. Yeah, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Leon. Well, that, well that, that was that. Yeah. That was this. There was this um, piece, and I think Barron's talked about, there, there's an economist that publishes this cost of living CPI, he, he calls it. Not, not a, um, not, not sorry, a price, not, not, a price of, not cost of living, um, standard of living. Standard of living CPI, like, like how to maintain a standard of living versus a year ago. Not, not, not a cost, of, it's, a, it's a different calculation. He gets his number to be 18%. Year on year? Year on year for to, to maintain a certain standard of living. Well, you, you know from economics one on one that people, you know, people start buying other things or you know changing products and so on and so forth. And that's and, and the problem is you know that the the, uh, the uh, CPI basket, which is what they use to you know value these things, hasn't doesn't change every year. It changes every like ten years. So the substitution effect is is very very big. And uh, it's, not, it's not clear what the actual personal inflation really is. So he's, <laughs> his aim was to, was to publish a sort of a, again, uh, well, what's the average cost of living? No, not again, again, standard of living. To maintain a certain standard of living, a family has to pay, pay 18% more to maintain that certain standard, which is not the same thing as cost of living, which is, I'm not sure exactly the details, but this is... Um, it was on ba- Barron's uh, on the, over the weekend, which was kind of interesting, I thought. So we have a question in the uh, chat. Can I, can I jump in? Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Of yeah. course. Uh, yeah, so uh, I turn on. Yeah, Andre Leshenka from Chicago. So Hi, uh, yeah, I, uh, one thing I, um, I think it's a little missing from this uh, discussion is wage inflation, all right? So uh, the, what we ha- see inflation is not purely demand, uh, I mean supply uh, inflation, but uh, also this demand and in particular uh, wage growth is uh, too high. And that's the danger, uh, I believe the ma- main danger that we have this 70s uh, when it's like feedback inflation, like uh, wage growth and then inflation and by, uh, prices. And that's what uh, I believe uh, this um, Fed can affect because if they cool the economy, if uh, unemployment uh, uh, creeps uh, back higher, then uh, this uh, wage inflation can probably be stopped. And that's the key uh, to avoid this runaway inflation. Well, you know, the, on the wage inflation front, it's interesting, there was a, I was on my board meeting with my condo in New York, and they, would, and they just settled, you know, with the doorman, right? Mm-hmm. They had a settlement with the uh, doorman, New York. We it was a twelve percent wage rise, plus that they're giving a bonus of each person five thousand dollars. Wow! Yeah. So, and so they they push this enormous 
wage increase, 12%. And we're talking at the board how like yeah. saying that these numbers are just like off. Normally it's like 2%, 3%. Uh -huh. They push to a 12% raise for all the all the um, union doormen. So then they, these are unskilled. Yeah. You know, and the average guy is making, let's say, 65,000, 70,000 a year now as a doorman. Uh -huh. You know, with these wage increases, so that's that's an example about how the wage growth is really taking hold, as you're as you're saying. So you, you know, that's, that, you that's sure true. That? Yeah, yeah, that's what I heard. Twelve percent. I saw a, a notice. I mean, I also live in uh, Manhattan. Well, it's over. It's over. I think it's over a couple, of, uh, like two or three years, though. So not not instantaneous. No, it's twelve percent over two or three years. Uh, yeah, right. Oh, I thought it was like three percent uh, okay. for the first year or something like that. So. It was yeah. I, I heard I heard the uh, the board chairman said you know we the the, the um, settlement came out yesterday or a Monday and it was uh -huh. like four percent over, over over a certain you know it was it was baked in to be four percent over I think two or three years. I mean to to return to Andre's point, Andre. I mean like I would assume there's economic theory pertaining to which where where that where there's a a stronger knock on effect if you raise rates just tighten monetary conditions do you do you first affect wages or do you affect prices do you affect kind of like i don't know unemployment. corporate corporate confidence unemployment right so if uh this uh, unemployment or quit rate you have this uh yes the quit rate yes right. exactly right right you know if it goes down people stay in a job uh so uh, in employers have less incentive to raise yes people. right Yes. So this could cool down uh, because otherwise it would be, you know, uh, wages go up, uh, then prices catch up, and then yeah. wages catch up. So it's like a, you know, this back and forth. Uh, that's what we have in the seventies, uh, uh, and that's most dangerous because it's very difficult to uh, stop that. But, yeah, I yeah, mean that, that that brings back the point I was making about trad traditional metrics that people have look, looked at for decades, right? In the employment report, you would look at like three key numbers, I think. Andy, correct me if I'm wrong. You look at the rate, you look at the non-farm payrolls and the hours and the and the earnings, right? So the earnings are measure hourly wages. earnings, yeah. Exactly. The earnings measures wages, right? You've got the rate. I guess you also have you also have you could also look at the you know, percentage of people who are employed in the um the underemployment rate, stuff like that. But, you know, traditionally it was an on-farm payrolls, the rate and maybe the earnings that would have the biggest immediate initial effect on how the rates markets reacted. So what I was going to say was, from what Andy seems to be saying, it's not a totally different story. Those things still count, right? I mean, I can't just say because it's, um, it's supply chain oriented that I can't use the same tools I used to use to interpret economic information into yeah, what, but, it but, for, but, what it means for rates. But I think there's a little difference to, to Andre's point. Uh, yes, wage inflation is important, but I don't think that's what's the overwhelming thing. When you have a jolts ratio or a jolts number saying that there are 11 and a half million jobs out there that aren't being filled, I think it's going to take a long time for, yeah. for, uh, for companies to catch up. Now, those jobs that aren't being filled, they could go away very quickly. But right now, I don't, I still, I'm gonna, I still believe that it's more supply side oriented than it is, than it is demand side oriented. And I think that's why inflation is going to maintain itself at probably four to five percent. You know, no, it's not going to sustain at eight and a half percent. You, you might get one more number right. like that. But but um, I don't think so. I think it's going to reverse. One more point. Uh, uh, it's in terms of uh, supply and demand inflation. Uh, it was uh, on Bloomberg yesterday. I heard uh, Bank of America was, uh, uh, I believe, from Bank of America, saying that uh, uh, actually they look at the um, balance on the deposits, and they what they see now uh, uh, the balances on the people you know deposits. Much higher, still much higher than it used to be. Uh, it used to be before the pandemics. So uh, when it was like two thousand, now they see like five thousand. So people still have uh, uh, because Cash. of this uh, yeah, pandemic, yeah. because of these um, uh, feds in, or government like uh, these uh, largesse, uh, government largesse, basically. Yes, they still have uh, lots of uh, how they put it, you know, the dry powder. Uh, and this creates extra demand and people like, you know, that's 
pushes inflation higher. I think that also has a salutary effect on the view of consumer credit because strangely enough, we've had actually more concerns raised about consumer balance sheets being stretched than corporate. Maybe because corporates were smart enough to borrow. Okay. Did Leon just freeze? <laughs> yeah, he did. Uh, All right, so basically, basically at low okay. euro auto loan sector. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, you know what? You, know, what, what you, you know, you know, you froze for a second there. Okay. I, what no, I was saying. Was, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. I was saying what what Andy was saying about about the you know supply side. If you look at the the way it's being looked at, is that no one's talking about moving this moving this you know the supply the supply line. If you look at the you know the supply demand curve, you can move the demand curve. This way, supply you know, and the supply curve seems to be not a, not a process to be um, looked at. And there's no effort in America or in the worldwide to sort of grow this to move the supply curve in a way that will help that will sort of lower prices. It's all being done I on, think on, what on the demand side. What they're side. trying to do is they're trying to move the supply chain so it's more domestic, less overseas, and yeah, you know, and and it just takes a long time. You know, right. I mean, I saw her on, on Wall Street Week, um, David uh, was uh, interviewing a woman who was a money manager, and she talks to a lot of corporate, a lot of corporate CEOs, and, and the consensus was that the supply chain, it will take another two to three years to correct it. So that's, that's a long time per se. Yeah. So I would tend to think that I'm still going to lean towards supply side. And I think this is why the Fed, which is affecting demand side, will have their uh, will find it very difficult to achieve anywhere near the two percent inflation. And I think they'll be forced to raise their targets, which right now they say they will not do. I think they're going to have to raise their targets yeah. from from two to three to four. In other words, well, they're just going to be we're going to be in a world of hurt. It's a little concerning because you know when we started this uh, tightening regime. People were saying we're going to cap out at low twos, and the market kind of got a little bit shocked and convulsed when they realized that the terminal rate was more like closer to three. And I Andy, you're suggesting we may get, we may go beyond that. Right now, that's not the case. Terminal rate right now is still like in the low threes, I believe. But who knows how it will reprice? Let me get back to let me get back to a point that Andy brought up before, which was, what, again, this is a little bit more instructional. Like, what do people look at? to extract from market prices the expectation for inflation. Well, you know, this can be challenged, but one, one thing that's been around for 20 plus years is the inflation indexed uh, treasury market, treasury bond market. And the you can extract from that market both a, what's called a break-even rate for some horizon, as well as a forward break-even rate. And the one that's favored by the Fed, this is, they've made this point multiple times, is the five-by-five five break-even. It simply is a calculation based on five-year nominals, five-year inflation protected bonds, and 10-year nominals, and 10-year inflation protected bonds. Here's a graph of that number, five-by-five. Five. It has given up. It has, you know, gone up from like, you know, low twos up to like two point. 55, right? Nowhere near the inflation prints we're, ex we're, ex we're exhibiting. Now, you can look at this and say, wait a minute, though. Is this because there's the market will not accept buying inflation-linked bonds at too negative a yield? Andy, we talked about this, right? That's right. So how low, how negative can the, can the inflation index real yield get, right? If it can't get too low, that, innate, that prevents the break even <laughs> from widening too much, right? So does that mean that this information is flawed? We can't use it as a as a guide for the market's expectation. Uh, Anybody else question. chime in? By the way, yeah, right. Well, well, uh, well, that's, well, that's a problem with, with that. With the you know, we look at the that entire analysis. That's the that's the Fed's that's the Fed's sort of you know basic view of inflation is the five year five year. You know, forward, right? right? They take the tips. They take the tip yield, and it do a forward tip. But you know, but if, if you look at the difference between that and let's say the five year, the the, the five year itself, you know, and then look at what the five year, look at what the inflation is. It's a huge difference, right? Of and course, you, exactly. I right. Mean, and which, that's, yeah. And that's the that was the, you know that was the traditional way. You, you look at the treasury yield, you know, minus the. The 12, 12 month rolling CPI. Right, and, right. And, and that, that was your real yield 
in the days right. before you had tips. Right, correct, right. right. And then, but, and, and the difference between that number and the tips yield is, is, is probably the biggest is probably, I'm sure ever been, of course. Right, yeah. That, that I mean, now, now here's the thing though, is that because the economy has a resistance <laughs> of real yields getting too low, basically, right? That's <laughs> what it amounts to, right? Nobody's going to buy real yields at negative four, right, or whatever it is, right? I don't, I don't quite understand this actually. What's the, what's the pressure point? Is it because we still have, you know, enough money out there to buy ten-year notes at three percent, and that's why the break-even is too narrow? But any, anybody want to chime in on this? Some of you may have looked at this more delicately than I have. So, well, well that, I mean, that, if, that the auction, the auction today was very good, right, right, Andrew? The, the, the auction for the Tips was, was very strong today, right? Oh, the tips one was about four through, yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, right. So that's oh. so people are that people are buying. There's big. There's been a big surge in buying of the tips for the right. last. Um, well, I was going to say. Weeks. I mean, they look cheap on the most naive uh, metric they <laughs> available. They look very cheap. Okay, so let's. That's enough on inflation. Let's talk about the balance sheet now. Okay, so Andy alluded to what the plan is. 95 billion a month comprised of 60 billion of treasury, 35 billion of uh, MBSs. So let me throw out the question to everybody. Andy, I'll start with you. Is there, capacity, is there capacity in the private markets to hold this, to warehouse this paper? Yeah, well, I, I, think, I, I think the question is, is will the, will the treasury, which basically these are, these are bonds are going back to the treasury. It's it's not being sold to the John, street. Yeah, I called because I, so, uh, so it, it's you know, will the my treasury brother and the, increase? My Andrew, that they're giving a zoom. We can, we can hear you, Armand. Armand we can hear you. In. Yeah, I thought yeah. Armand was Armand. Giving, what, oh. Armand, do, we yeah. can hear you. You want to? I'm sorry. I'm do, sorry. Please? Okay. Yeah. Andy, go ahead. I'm sorry. Andy, go You're ahead. Going to be on the phone. Thank you. Look, Leon. What it is? It's not like these bonds are going into the market immediately. First of all, let's let's break down what the sixty billion a month is. The sixty billion, the Fed's going to going to let all their coupons roll off. And historically, if the Fed was letting a seven year coupon roll off, even though it's it's got one month to maturity, when that seven year rolls off, they would reinvest in the next seven year. Right. They will not be doing that. Right. So that's going to add duration to the street, and that's cross the whole spread product from twos all the way out to thirty years. So the, then the question is, who's, who's responsible for these treasuries? And, and it is the treasury itself. Now, will Janet Yellen increase the sizes as the Fed no longer buys? In other words, you know, if they're going to do a, a, a 25 or 30, say a 30 billion, you know, three year, you right. know, are they now going to do a, a smaller 31 one, yes, billion yeah. three year or 32 billion three year? And I think they have to. Now to your question is, who's going to buy that? You know, I think that there's plenty of money as I think there's plenty of money across the system. And, and it's all about bits and starts that on any given day, there's plenty of money, even though I think liquidity is awful. There's plenty of money in the banking system. One thing they should do is they one of the things they didn't do last year is they had the supplemental reserve ratio, which would allow banks to buy more treasuries. They worked that for a period of time and then they wouldn't allow that to continue. But I think they'll do something like that. Plus, with the yen, you know, we haven't talked about the dollar yet, but the yen has just gotten annihilated. Yes, yeah, I think it's yes. gone from 114 to 128, you know, give or take. And now the Japanese are starting to wake up to the fact that that they're gonna they are buying treasuries, you know. Plus the plus the uh, fact that the Bank of Japan earlier in the week said for the next four days they're gonna buy unlimited amounts of their own of their own JGBs, so at, at ridiculously low levels. So I think the Japanese will step in, you know, and, and I think if you look at, and the funny thing is, you know, if, if you look at the economies of the world, of the top three economies of the world, you know, in, in this order, the US, the Chinese, and the Japanese, the last two are in terrible shape. You know, they're, they're basically in recessions or, or certainly massive slowdowns, China, because of, of 430 million people, and that could be more or less right now being in quarantine, and in Japan uh, is starting to go into a very big slowdown. So I think the Japanese have more than enough money to, to pick up a lot of the slack, as well as I believe that banks and other investors. 
So I think it's going to be okay. Then the question is, who's going to pick up all the mortgages? That's well, a want, much tougher one. That's the question I'm going to ask uh, Bill and Kevin. Bill, let me ask you first. I mean, do you think the traditional MBS investor base has been for years now underinvested in mortgage product? Are they ready to take up the take up the slack and grow their portfolios of agency mortgages? What do you think? Or Kevin so, also? What do you guys think? My my take is I don't think they're underinvested, but I do think, and I'm actually you know this is a timely because I'm actually working on this now is that what the fed owns is very different than what, where the market is now, the feds holdings are probably 40%, um, you know, 30 year twos and two and a half. Right. <laughs> very underwater. Yeah. Very, very so low coupon there, paper. You know, yeah. You're talking 80 handles. Right. Exactly. Top. Right. Right. So, you know, it's a real good question. I, you know, it's almost, you know, I think, I think the same, my, my take is that, you know, mortgages, MBS have been getting crushed over the past three weeks with the idea that, um, that the Fed is eventually going to be an active seller. They've, you know, the, the um, I think twos have basically underperformed by maybe a point and a half since the beginning of the month, uh, you know, versus a 10-year hedge ratio. Um, it's a real good question, you know, to, I think Andy's point as to where treasuries go may, to a certain extent, be also where a lot of the mortgages go. It's not going to, I don't know that it's going to be a traditional MBS player because like a bank doesn't want to buy a two or two and a half in this environment. Um, it's more of a value play, if you right. will. And so it's a real, it's a real good question. I think the markets that the markets are reacting to that. And I think that's one of the reasons you've seen this big up in coupon trade in mortgages, as well as the overall, you know, poor performance. Yeah. I mean, you would think that there's some, Non, I don't mean banks, non-bank. There's some non-bank buyers who looked at valuations a year and a half ago and said, low yields, tight spreads. I'm not, inter I'm not interested oh, in the product, right? So now, it's a so lot now more they're interested appealing. all of a sudden, right? <laughs> now it's you a know? lot more appealing, but again, exactly. do I want to be in, do I really want to be in twos and two and a halves? Right, exactly, right. But can they somehow massage that a bit, Bill? Maybe sort of like sell the higher coupon stuff first, perhaps? I don't know. I mean, what you know, like- Us? Possibly. I mean, that's a good point. And at a certain point, it becomes attractive. A lot of it's going to depend on what prepayments do um, and housing does and such. But there's only so much you can, you know, hammer this uh, horseshoe, you know, to keep it yeah. you know, still fit on the horse. And by the way, have you heard anything, anybody say anything about the fact that Andy mentioned this, at the higher rate environment right now, the realized duration of, the, of their mortgage paper has lengthened, right? Are people concerned about continuing negative convexity implications of that and makes it going to make it even harder to move this paper off their balance sheet? What do you think? I think the well, point is well, a good one. Um, the, my sense, and I'll, I'll be real brief, is that people are saying MBS, the MBS market is basically extended out as far as it can go. Okay. Sorry, well, what I would so say, I, I was going to make the point that, you know, the Fed is probably, the Fed, two things the largest mortgage investor in the world and doesn't, doesn't mark to market. And so, doesn't, and doesn't hedge and doesn't hedge duration. It does, doesn't hedge. So what you're going to have is over the next, between now and the end of the year, starting either in late May or in June, you're going to have the fed basically roll off everything that it's going to roll off and they won't be reinvesting and that will still keep them under at the end of the year, or as we approach the end of the year, the Fed will look and say, hey, we don't like the ratio we have of treasuries, of mortgages being too high now to our treasury you know, portfolio. And then I think they'll look to sell. And that's when, the, that's when the Fed really says, oh, my God, look how much money I've lost, you know, that kind of thing. But I don't think it's going to be a problem for the next four months. You think they'll favor selling the treasuries down first, you mean, Andy, and then they'll look at the mortgages, right? On, on, no, no. On they, the margin. They, Leon, they are going to, these are disciplined people. Now, the reason they're disciplined may, may be wrong, but they're not going to sell more than 60 billion. They're not going to let mature more than 60 billion of treasuries. That's it. Okay. And, you know, if they, if they couldn't, if they couldn't let a mortgage mature, it's not like they're going to add another 35 billion. You know, it's 60 billion. And right. if they don't reach 60 billion in coupons, they're going to let bills run off, but they will match that 60 billion in mortgages. 
they're only going to let stuff run off for the, for the next, between now and pretty much the end of the year. And whatever that number is, that's what will roll so off. So you're saying that, that number is going to be below 35. So you're saying that if they look, if you look at how much is redeemed in a given month, right? The point is the total mortgage outstanding that they hold one one month later will be 35 billion less, including what's re, what's been redeemed during that month. Is what you're saying? I don't think I'm saying exactly that. What okay. I'm saying is 35 billion is the maximum they will redeem in a given month, and that is basically refinancings. And as in, as those roll offs go under 35 billion, and they were 38 billion in this current month, and but I think as as you go, given what mortgage rates are doing, be much given lower, what rates yes. in general are doing, of course, yes, it's it's going to be well below 35, and that number is going to go smaller and smaller. And they'll and smaller. sell and they'll sell more to make it bring it up to 35, basically. No, 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 they won't. They won't. They will do nothing except let stuff roll over. Okay. And that will screw up their ratios. Yes. At the end of the year, you know, or maybe at the beginning of next year, they will say, hey, look, this isn't working. You know, we've got to start selling our mortgage portfolio so we can, you know, average it out. And they will then start if they have 20 billion of redemptions, uh, then they will sell 15 billion. They will go into the street and sell 15 billion. But that is a 2023 or December of 22 type issue. I see. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, we're running out of time here. Let's let's try to uh, take cover one more topic which you wanted to talk about. Um, thank you everybody for your comments. And you want to talk about the and Kevin asked about this the projected rate uh, tightenings. Well, here's the page, Kev, that uh, Andy alluded to. WIRP. Andy, you want to talk talk through this page? Yeah, I mean, look, when Leon was in his prime, and not to say Leon's still not in his prime, <laughs> he would, you know, he in. in and our partner at the time, Stan Jonas, they would love to look at Euro dollar futures and, and they would do everything. And I just didn't pay that much attention. Now in the last year or two, Bloomberg has made it incredibly easy. They put what I call work, which is world interest rate probabilities. So if you're looking at this chart right now and you're looking at May 4th, 22 on the left, number of hikes cuts, this is basically telling you there are two 25 basis point hikes built into the May 4th number, which translated means the Fed will raise 50 basis points in May. And pretty much Paul said that today. The next number down, the next line down at the June 15th meeting, that number is, is still more than two, even after you take out the number above it. So it looks to me like they will raise another 50 on June 15th. And I don't know what time Leon did this today, but you know maybe he did it, uh, you know, later in the day or maybe earlier in the day. And the third number is July sixth, so they will raise another two twenty-five basis points or another fifty. So that's why who asked the question at the beginning of the year? Am I anticipating? Is it my view that the Fed is going to raise fifty at the next three meetings? It's basically what what this is telling you. Now beyond that. I don't put much credence in that because as the front, as the Fed front runs the market about raising rates, I think we're going to have an equity correction of some kind. I don't think we're going to go into recession, but I think the Fed's going to feel a lot of pain. And as the Fed feels a lot of pain, as well as when when balance sheet starts to kick in and cause additional rate rises in theory and basis points, I think the Fed's going to slow it down. I really do. And, you know, they'll, they'll wait and see. The last thing that Powell wants to do is he has spent from 2020 till today to get the unemployment rate down from 10 something percent down to wherever Leon said the last one was three, five, three, six. Doesn't really matter. That's where he wants it to be. He doesn't want to see it to go back to five percent or, as BlackRock said, possibly back to 10 percent. So I think the Fed is going to be much slower. And will they? Are, you know, look, the Fed is so far behind the curve. They should have been doing this a year ago when the markets would have accepted a lot better. But the point is that they're doing it now. And this is what we anticipate will happen. 350 basis point rate rises and balance sheet that's going to affect the yield curve as well as add more pressure. I think the Fed slows it down after that. Um, I believe that's all I wanted to say on this. 
Some of you may remember, uh, I looked at this actually earlier this year. You go back to other periods where we were in the beginning of a rate tightening cycle. You saw um, more than often than not that the uh, rates markets overshot. And thus you could have made money by basically buying rates uh, one and a half, two years out and riding them up. Now I checked this same uh, configuration earlier this year, didn't seem to me that was the case, but now with additional you know, decline in the back end futures, I think it may still be true. For instance, can you make money buying, let's say, you know, uh, these 23 at three and a half percent? What do you think, Andy? Will your library be three and a half percent at the end of next year? Or will it be tighter well, shorter you know, than that? Leon, I mean, a lot of us start to think that the, you know, the Fed may start to ease sometime in 23. Right. OK. I, yes. I think they're going to slow down the amount. So, yeah, I would say you're probably right. I don't know that, that this is net. You know, I'm not very well. I am very good at picking tops and bottoms, but I'm not so sure that this is necessarily bottom. I just feel that as we get into, we've got two more weeks until the May 4th meeting. You know, two more weeks as of yesterday, and the Fed goes into into blackout period tomorrow. So I think things might get a little bit worse before they get better. But I think you're on to a trade. Yeah, I, I think fundamentally the argument is to stay very defensive. But I think on historical grounds, given the way the rate complex is set up right now, uh, I think you may be back in a situation where you could take a flyer and sort of buying stuff maybe a year to two out. But again, of course, things are, I've been, this whole theme of this talk has been, things aren't the same. You can't use the same yardsticks that we've used for a long time in interpreting right. what the rates are doing. Now, I see that we have uh, 22 chat, people. Yeah. 22, well, I'll, I'll answer the chats in a minute, but I, I want to say this because this is what I tell my own family, that if you have money in a bank right now, you're going to find that banks generally aren't going to pay what treasuries are at. So you can look at the treasury yield curve. You can see six months at 127, one year's at 198, or two-year WIs with a two-year auction next week at 272. I've put my family into two-year treasuries. You know, not only do you have state, there's state tax exempt, but 272 just strikes me as, <laughs> it, as, Not as, bad. as a great value given, you know, your money markets are still yielding 0.01 or 0.11 if you're in New York or whatever, you know, that strikes me as a value. That's all because I'm not supposed to be giving financial advice. <laughs> as far as the questions that are in the chat, uh, let's just break them down. One, let me just go. Uh, can uh, let's see, can we convert today's inflation rate and measure it the same way as measuring the Volcker years? I believe that's what Larry Summers said. You know, search Larry Summers or Wall Street Week. Basically, if, if we're at eight and a half percent CPI now, that's effectively what it was under Volcker's regime. Under Vol Volcker's regime, measured in the same way, uh, is re rent inflation is a big problem, not wage inflation. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Look, in Austin, Texas, where I am right now, year over year, rent inflation's up 40%. Phoenix, it was up 39%. And I think nationally, for all things, it's up 17%. Uh, what is the total wage cut? Well, it's Armand. I, you know, I can talk to him about it. Isn't BlackRock massively buying mortgages? Look, BlackRock's got a tremendous amount of money. Uh, Rick Reeder's been, been somewhat positive. Um, you know, in, in, as far as where things are going, I think he's pretty much had it right. He said 10 years would get around 3%. Is he, is he buying mortgages right now for BlackRock? I can't say one way or the other. We haven't seen him come in. Is it possible to drop the slides in the chat? Um, that's Leon's career. They're, they're on, they're on, uh, they were, they were mailed out by Zothra. They're on, they're on via an email. They were sent out earlier today. Giannis. All right. Anyone have any questions? Any more, que any more questions? Uh, there's so, one one thing. The uh, labor, the the, um, the great resignation. That what, the question is, what oh, yes. are the people who are resigning doing? Are they <laughs> are they sitting on the sidelines? Are they going back just changing no. jobs? I think they're no, yes. they're not. I, I believe from from what I'm reading, the quits ratio that people are more much more comfortable resigning and in, in looking for other jobs. I mean, Leon picked up something that we did at a talk three months ago, and 
in Price Waterhouse at the time had come out with a report saying 65% of all employees are out there, you know, looking for other jobs. Now, I don't know how they got that, but it is something that came across the Wall Street Journal. Yeah, so, so I'm, no. curious about, I'm curious about the, the evolution of the labor force participation rate. Has that gone up, uh, gone down rather? I, it's, uh, it's still lower, Kevin, than it was before COVID for sure. Right. Right. But is that uh, because of the retirees who are not going to come back? I'm just wondering how, yes. how fast the, uh, the supply no, in the no, labor yes, market Exactly, clears. right, yeah. right. Now, the retirees are now just starting to come back that yeah. COVID has, has been reduced. People that retired are coming back. Uh, there are more retirees. I forget, I don't have the stat in front of me, but I read it recently on Bloomberg. There are more retirees that are coming off the sidelines. Well, I think, so, I, think, I, 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 Andy, I, think I think because of inflation, they're saying, they're saying because of inflation is so high, people are forced to go back to work. That's what that's what uh, saying. That, that, that I thought that, it was more like COVID had, had pretty much come down, but you know it could be a multiple of reasons. Yeah, there's. I mean, on, on the on the one hand, the you know the, the inflationary situation when it comes to just basic foodstuffs and gas, people are who were resigned. They're saying I, I better start working because I can't I can't live on my savings anymore because just I just the living costs have gone up too much. So there, there's been some small movement from people who are. Resigned so, or quit back into the labor force because of the inflation rates. So yeah, high. so to, to the extent there's people sitting on the sidelines who come back into the labor market, the labor market could clear faster than yes, that's good physical point. supply chain, which which will be right. much longer. Yeah. Training new people, go. on the other hand, is is also a long cycle. So yes, it's the question is how many people are sitting on the sidelines. Well, you're right. Like yeah, let's let, yeah, you're right, Kevin. I agree. Let's let's say if the participation rate, let's say, is three or four percent below what it was pre-COVID, that's a lot of people. Yeah. Right. That could re-enter the labor force and and soften some of the wage demands. No question about it. Yeah. Um, well, a lot I, of I think, yeah. I, well, I think also with, with the inflation situation, I, I think you're, you're going to see a shift of what goods are inflationary. You'll see basically, you know, what's discretionary. Let's say people buying furniture, appliances, things like this will will be just but we have a have a, basically a buyer strike because people will simply just spend too much money on eggs. You know, milk. You know, meat. That that'll be the. We'll see inflation still, but the money will shift. I think that, that there could be a demand, like an inventory hangover, from some of the um, discretionary you know, to, spending. To your point, Armand, a city had a, an article yesterday, right. saying that that the truckers, the trucking has slowed down some unbelievable percentage, fifty percent, in the last ten days. And one of the reasons, you know, just one was the fact that many places are already overstocked. That's so right. So I think that slowdown is is probably happening now. Yeah, that's, I agree with you because I think people, are, look, at some point there's a, there's a buyer strike, like somebody right. somebody doesn't have to buy a new washing machine, but he, but he has to buy eggs and milk. So he's shifting his money to essentials. And it's the same with lumber, you know, the lumber costs and the you know cost of renovation, those things were so high and that they're, that's slowing down because the costs are just too high. So I think but also will... also because the housing price because of the high mortgage rates, right? That's going to slow down the entire housing complex, uh, the whole uh, ecosystem, yeah, but, right? But, but make sure you understand. I think ninety percent of the people with homes are very happy and, and can afford them because they have mortgages at two and a half and three percent. That but they could not possibly go out and and get a get a new mortgage or or right. whatever. But, you know, it, it's the marginal people, the people that are out trying to buy a home today or the people that are, are subject to rent increases. But the majority of people have their homes, they're set, and they're not worried about, about a lot of that, about the rising housing market and price, the rising housing market, the rising mortgage rates. It's only the people on the periphery or the people on the, on the margin that are making the, those moves. You know, one thing that wasn't uh, brought up um, today, which is kind of interesting, is this this war in Europe and what it's done for food and energy prices. Oh, uh, absolutely. It's a subject for another webinar at some point. <laughs> you know, it's well, I, I would tell you and, this. If Leon were to ask me, how do you rate, you know, recession probabilities between the U.S. and Europe, I would say it's much higher in Europe because this war is is causing tremendous uh, upheaval in energy and so on and so forth. Like I said, German PPI yesterday 
was up 31% year over year. I mean, that, it's, you know, that's, that's just horrible. But, uh, but no, we didn't bring it up. It didn't come up, didn't bring it up. There was plenty else. To One talk interesting about. thing I'd point out is the CPI, the month over month core CPI has actually rolled over a little bit. Yes. There's a little bit of a ray of hope that the Fed can actually get control of inflation, take away the, the war effects of energy and food. That was one of Lyle Brainerd's comments last week. Bill, do, Bill, do you think, to what extent do you think the combination of continued HPI going up, HPI going up and the huge jump in mortgage rates, is that taking affordability to like unprecedented uh, um, low levels, would you say? I'm crushing it. Actually, the Mortgage Bankers Association just came out with a new kind of metric that they call PAPI, and I forget P-A-P-I, right. I don't remember what it stands for, but it's an interesting kind of variation on the affordability index that they've been publishing for decades. Um, and it's definitely, you know, kind of rising very steeply. Right. And eventually, you know, maybe six, eight months from now, that has to take some of the starch out of home price appreciation. Yes, right. right now, it's just, if you look, there's less than a one month of existing home supply in the market. Right. Unbelievable. Well, again, yeah. because probably supply chains have slowed down construction, right? That's a factor. Yeah. But it's also, you know, the funny thing is like new home construction is actually pretty strong and there is supply on the market in the new home market, but that's much, that's like eight to 10% of the overall housing market. Yes, right. Yeah. They were talking about how just on demographic grounds alone, this was before the last, the run up in rates, we needed to build more houses than we were building. To meet demographic, the change in demographic demand, that 100%. was a story as well. Yeah, yes, that's a, that's a decade-long story. <laughs> right, right. Well, if you own a house, you're happy about it. that. Well, hey, I'm I'm sitting pretty here in Arizona and being very thankful that my wife uh, insisted that we move. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is a record for us. You know, usually we try to end at seven. You know, so we create a reputation <laughs> well, for being succinct and so on. Well, and uh, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, David, for hosting this. And thank you, everybody, again, for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. And we thank you very much for your comments and insights. I have two announcements to make, uh, just briefly. Um, first of all, um, next week, uh, April 28th, we'll have Andre Lyashenko speaking. Uh, he's from Quantitative Risk Management, Inc. He's on the call today, as a matter of fact. And the name of his paper, I think I have it here, will be... Um, Bridging P the PQ modeling divide with factor uh, Heath Gerald Morton modeling framework. So this sounds like a, sounds like a very interesting talk, and hopefully uh, you can you can attend and uh, and and Andre, you'll, you'll have a chance to uh, to show off your stuff uh, next week. Yeah, it will be quant talk, so just the one you yeah. Have. Don't don't be concerned. Uh, today was the exception rather than the rule. We didn't have a single <laughs> formula. <laughs> or a derivation, right? but it was right. it was lively, and I'm so happy that for a change, fixed income has, has now become lively. <laughs> yeah, I, brought, I brought this to the discussion. Yeah, I trust the HB 12C. Okay, good, good. <laughs> um, the second announcement I have, of course, is for the uh, Peter Carr Memorial Conference. As you know, uh, it's coming up June uh, 2nd to June 4th. Um, I should let you know for this particular crowd, we're still open for uh, abstracts. We have a pretty good. Um, a uh, pretty good group developing for speakers, but we can squeeze in a few more. If you uh, want to submit an abstract, and even a, we're taking practitioner papers that also are related to Peter Carr's work. Um, we have a 4.30 deadline for receiving those abstracts. Uh, and so we can, uh, you know, if, if you'd like to, please get those in. So we can we can consider you with the uh, help of the scientific committee uh, as to who to select to, to speak on the, the two days, Friday and Saturday, the third and fourth of, uh, of June. Um, okay, so uh, any final questions that are just uh, administrative in nature? Great. Well, thanks again to the speakers. This is fabulous. Uh, I hope to see you uh, see, you, see you again, many of you in person uh, in, in June, and uh, and uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully next week as well. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. -bye. Yeah, good night. Take care, Leon. We'll talk next week.